Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to the fifth episode of The Path to a New Edition. In this series I'm going over the playtest packages that Wizards of the Coast sent out in their D&D Next program back in 2012 on the lead-up to 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, a program which I was lucky enough to be involved with. So these were various test rules for the next edition of Dungeons & Dragons, and they were trying things out, they were hurling rules at the wall and seeing what stuck. And I think the fifth package is the most extreme of these. There's a lot of interesting differences. They were really going for high damage in this version. But let's go over to this setup and have a look. So on unzipping Playtest Package 5, we are presented with the read first file, as we have been in the others. Now this one's dated January 28th, 2013. So we've gone through New Year, we've done with 2012, and we're on to 2013. And the last package was in October. So three months have passed, and there's a lot of updates in this one. Now, a bunch of the files are dated in December, so the work was ongoing throughout, but this is when they sent it out. Now, the using the packet uh, section of the file is pretty much standard. However, we've got the changes in this packet. Now, we've got classes. Barbarian. The Barbarian class is now part of the playtest. So, we had Warlock and Sorcerer in previous ones, they went out and haven't been re-included yet, but the Barbarian is in, so we can see what they're like. And we have clarifications. The Cleric and the Monk classes both contain clarifications. Well, the biggest clarification for the Monk will be the entire thing, because we haven't had the Monk in any of the previous packages. This is the first time we're seeing it. So it really should have been classes Barbarian and Monk are now included. But for some reason, they must have been playing with Monk internally, and they modified it before including in this, so they were a little confused as to what was actually going in the package for the first time. How to play. Invisible creatures now have advantage on attack rolls. There's resolving tied initiatives has been simplified. Clarifications. New pieces of the how to play document have been clarified. Uh, character creation has been expanded. Spells have had durations adjusted. They've included the Cult of Chaos adventure with a conversion document instead of converting the adventure as they have done with previous ones. There's known issues. Certain player characters deal more damage than desired, and we will come to that, and by heck, it's a big known issue. Um, very obvious without playtesting to me. Um, the DCs in the Caves of Chaos, Isle of Dread, and Reclaiming Blindenstone adventures do not reflect those currently in the DM Guidelines files. So they've not updated the adventures. Character sheet might no longer reflect optimal presentation for the available character options. Well, it's not bad. Um, they've gone very vague compared to the first ones which were laid out for that set of rules. This is a lot more vague um, with just descriptive areas. And it's fine. But carrying on... We have the how to play. Well, the big one they mentioned was the initiative update. There's small updates throughout this, but they're, they're very uh, similar to other versions of Dungeons and Dragons. You're not going to notice a massive amount of differences between this and 5th edition. Now, in the combat, there's the resolving ties, which they say they've simplified. If there is a tie, the tied creatures roll a d20 to determine their order. Highest roll going first. If there are still ties, continue rolling until they're resolved. Well, I don't actually know what the proper rules for resolving ties are. In virtually every game we play, if people tie on it, you go to the attribute which seems most sensible, an agility or a dexterity-based attribute. Whoever's got the highest is probably the fastest character, so we go in that order. Or, these days, my groups are a lot more respectful of each other, and they tend to go, well, after you, and let other players go first. Um, it's never really caused any problems. But it's interesting to know that in this version it's pretty much completely random. Uh, carrying on through, there's all the usual sections. Um, long rests and short rests are pretty much the same. The um, dead is still if you're, or when you're dying, when you reach zero hit points, you're still making saves or taking a d6 damage and getting uh, progressively lower until your character dies. We've got various exper experimental rules for rests and healing. 
um, basically taking it so in like in the fifth edition when you're fully healed or ones which it takes a lot longer like in the older editions where you would heal up over very long periods without magic we've got the conditions we've got how to cast spells and that's that it's getting quite bulky it's 24 pages for the rules and there's 14 pages of dm guidelines but these are only expanding out they're not radically different so how to engage your players how to make multiple checks um, difficulty to, uh, for different attributes um, carrying on through when to call for checks determining DC target numbers um, incidental tasks creature sizes um, drowning, illumination encounters and rewards so the different experience requirements given out for fighting monsters of different levels um, the rewards you get, treasure tables, so random things you get for killing monsters. We've got the creating character section, which is slightly different. We've got determine ability score, scores, choose a race, choose a class, and now it is baked into it, choose a background. In all the previous ones, the choose a background was as an optional rule, much as the choose a speciality feat still is in this version. But now they've made it more essential, which is kind of odd because they seem to have been chipping away at the purpose of the backgrounds right through it. But it's nice to see it in. Um, we have assign ability scores, choose equipment, fill in the numbers, describe your character, and then beyond first level with the experience rewards needed to go up levels and what you get. Um, the next file is the races. Now, the races are still similar to the last package. Um, as I pointed out, the dwarves, elves, and halflings have their uh, weapon training. So dwarven weapon training. When you attack with a battle axe, double axe, great axe, hand axe, light hammer, maul, ugrush, or warhammer, you increase the damage die for it. So a d4 to a d6, a d6 to a d8, d8 to a d10, d10 to d12, and d12 to 2d6. Now, that's important for what's coming later, that these types are doing more damage. Because, as they pointed out, some character classes do more damage than wanted. Um, elves get it still for a long bow, uh, sorry, long sword, short bow, uh, bow, and long bow. And halflings get it for daggers, short swords, or slings. Um, humans don't get it at all. Then we come on to the classes. So we have Barbarians. Now, Barbarians do not get maneuvers in the same way that fighters and rogues did in the last version. And in fact, rogues have somewhat had it cut back from them. But what they've introduced in this version is martial damage dice and martial damage bonus. So the Barbarian and other types get a martial damage dice, and at level 1 it's 1d6 for the Barbarian. And they get to add it to any one attack they do in each round. It refreshes in any round. Now at higher levels they got to 6d6 and they can split it, so they do 6d6 on one attack, or they do 3d6 on one and 3d6 on another, or if they've got far more attacks than that they can split it out however they want. The martial damage dice are also used for powering the maneuvers so if you've got a maneuver which allows you to do a certain thing you can channel one of your d6 into allowing you to do that maneuver but as i said barbarians don't tend to get maneuvers in the same way fighters do the martial damage bonus as well is if they're proficient in a weapon they get to add that bonus to one attack per round again now at level seven they get a plus five at level 11 they get a plus 10, at level 14 they get a plus 15, and at level 17 they get a plus 20. So at higher levels a barbarian can add plus 20 to one attack as well as 66 to that same attack. As well as if they're a dwarf they're upgrading the damage uh, dice for that weapon. So if they're using an attack uh, Axe, they'll be upgrading the, I believe it's a d12 up to 2d6, so we'll be averaging a higher roll. 
and then adding all these extra dice and a bonus on it and their strength and whether they're raging and getting bonuses that way. This creates warrior types which are immensely dangerous. They do huge amounts of damage. Now I can see why they wanted to introduce this because obviously wizards are damage dealers at high levels with fireballs and their spells they can hand out massive amounts of damage and fighters and warriors have always lagged a bit behind but i always felt it was balanced because the spells can't be used as often whereas this is recharging every uh, combat round but anyway carrying on through we've got the class features which look very familiar number of rages um, rage damage bonus, which also goes up. Um, we've got their features, so combat expertise, iron hide rage. These all look fairly familiar to you. They've been uh, changed around a bit. We've got clerics. Well, clerics get the martial damage dice as well. So they start to get 1d6 extra at, I think that's 6th level, going up to 4d6 at 18th level. And they get the martial damage bonus, which only starts at 18th level. Which is quite good. Um, clerics have always been a sort of backup type of fighter. But it lags way, way behind the other types. Um, if we carry on through to fighters, we can see their martial damage bonus is very similar progression to the Barbarian. Martial damage dice, martial damage bonus. And they do get still get maneuvers which they power off the martial damage dice. Um, monks, which are introduced for the first time, these look relatively similar. Um, there's a lot more options in 5th edition, this is a bit of a stripped down one, but we can see they get the martial damage dice and martial damage bonus as well. They get key, but it's only so many points per day which is phrased slightly oddly because it should be once every long rest but they're obviously sort of still knocking the flaws out of this this is still very much prototype versions um combat expertise we've got the key we've got the monastic traditions the path of mercy path of phoenix path of the four storms path of the stones endurance uh, monastic training these are all relatively similar and um, the perfect self especially all of your ability scores that are lower than 20 become 20 at level 20 we've got the key abilities we've got the rogue and they've got combat expertise but they're not getting the maneuvers anymore they get rogue ske schemes skill masteries and skill tricks but they do get martial damage dice and martial damage bonus. So they are way more warrior types than clerics, which I find kind of odd because um, rogues were always a bit more sneaky. And carrying on through, we've got the wizards who do not get any martial weapon bonuses at all. They just get their spells and their class features are basically spellcasting, tradition of wizardry, wizardly knowledge from level one. Going on, we've got the manoeuvres. Well, as described before, they are the special manoeuvres that you get to do and you power them from your martial damage dice. These are interesting, but I think they're just very similar to feats were in 3rd edition. We've got background and skills. So you've got your skill dice for different levels and you choose your skills. In this version, basically you're only getting a certain amount of skills and they go up with your level. Instead of being able to get far more skills as you did in the third edition because you were getting the points and you could distribute them out as you wanted. Um, so we've got the backgrounds and how they distribute out your skills so if you're a bounty hunter your skills are gather rumors sense motive track and use rope but you've got your traits so bounty hunters can uh, find information about fugitives and bounties placed on their heads and secure the legal authority to hunt down and capture or kill those fugitives uh, charlatans have a false identity uh, commoners are salt of the earth you can find a place to hide rest or recuperate amongst other commoners um, 
I like these little features. I really wish they'd kept them in. Uh, what else we got? The skill descriptions. I'm going to try and keep going through these fairly quickly. Uh, we've got feats, which are fairly standard. You choose a feat, but they get better as you go up. So you've got your speciality here. If you're an ambusher, you, level one, you get a improved initiative feat. At level three, you get first strike. Level six, you get ambush. Level nine, you get covert strike. So instead of you getting feats, which you then choose yourself, the speciality is choosing your feats for you. And then we've got the list of the feats themselves. And the next file is spells. I'm not going to go through these in any detail, but these are just generally Dungeon and Dragon spells. So we've got Detect Magic, we've got Detect Undead, Dimension Door, just with slight changes with them. Um, equipment, again, as very standard, armor and shields, um, different types of weapons. These we've seen many times before and continue to see. Magic items, again, just random magic items, uh, different types, going through, you know, getting your plus one armor or your black dragon scale of resistance. Magic armor with a higher bonus than plus one. It's just giving you ideas for magical items which can be handed out. We've got the conversion notes for Against the Cult of Chaos. We've got still got the Caves of Chaos adventure. We've still got the Isle of Dread adventure. We've still got the Reclaiming Blindenstone. And now we have the Mud Sorcerer's Tomb as well. An adventure for four 14th level characters. So we're getting to quite higher levels because pack 4 did allow you to go up to 20th level. Now, I've not played this adventure, but it looks alright. Um, fairly combat based. Um, some illustrations in here which are unusual for these playtest documents because they were just heavily text. But... It's an adventure, there's some handouts there of various symbols, there's the dungeon itself. So, Package 5 introduced massive amounts of damage that you can do in combat. They really took it to the max with the martial damage bonus and martial damage dice. Um, I do not like these modifications. They seem unnecessary and... So much of this seems to be taking away choice. I know that 3rd edition and 4th edition were seen as overly complex with too many choices and players it taking a long time to level up because you would have to spend all your skill points, you'd have to choose all your feats, all your maneuvers, yada 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 to customize your character. And this is all about, well you've chosen your specialities so you get these feats. You have chosen your background so you get these skills. And all your extra damage is coming from your level. It's going very much back to basics, but not in a way I like. But anyway, I think I've witted on for way too long. So thank you very, very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves. And I'll catch you later. Bye now.